This is my wife, Becky. We founded uh, Evidence Ministries in 1995, and I've been a full-time missionary to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons since 1999. And we've been coming here to Manti since the year 2000, so this is my 11th year straight. And I, just a, a word of encouragement to you guys. Again, how many of you are new? Okay, that's the vast majority of you guys, of us. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool that I, I think about often when I'm out on the streets is you know, the Mormons have the idea that we're all in disagreement with each other, but we're all what? We're all Christian. Okay, so here, I want to do something. All of the different denominations that are here, on the count of three, I want you all to yell out your denomination. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Non-denomination. Non-denomination. But we are all Christians. Christians. Unity and diversity. I couldn't tell anything anybody said other than afterwards John says, non-denominational. <laughs> <laughs> but we all understood Christian, right? That needs to be, I mean, last night was awesome because, in fact, we had a guy come up afterwards, after the pageant had already started. And he made a comment about all the different denominations, yet we're all preaching the same kind of thing, and, and he was kind of bewildered at that. Is Tim here? Yeah, it's Tim. Yeah, Tim. From Faith something or other. Seth King. Yeah, Seth King talks to a guy named Tim. Is Tim here? Okay, never mind. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I, I just wanted to kind of do that little exercise to sort of encourage you that, that you know, we are all one. We are all together. And when Becky and I first started this ministry, to be honest, or not the ministry, but when we were first out here in, uh, at Manti, the first couple of nights, we did not get into any conversations. I just watched because I wanted to see how things went, and I wanted to hear what people said. And then, you know, towards the end of Friday night, you know, I'm starting to get into conversations. And, and this was actually before Chip was even doing the training sessions at the church. You know, so it was hard because we really didn't know a lot of people. We came the first week, and then we found out there's a second week to the pageant, and a lot of cool people come the second week, too, and we felt chip. <laughs> so, we come both weeks. And at least I do. Uh, we've got children now, so Becky has to go home and relieve the grandparents. But uh, it, this is an awesome, growing experience, and, and uh, I, I know you guys uh, already know that. But one of the things that we, we do and this is a term that I came up with. I did not develop the approach, but it's the impossible gospel of Mormonism. Chip wants us to teach it every year, especially this year, because we've got a, a lot of new folks. How many of you have not heard the impossible gospel? Okay, everybody here has heard it, but most of you are new. Uh, but it's one thing to hear it, and I've always taught it with different emphasis, but we've never really practiced it. So this is actually going to be the first time that we're doing a role play. I'm going to be me, and Becky's going to be Sister Walker, and, uh, and we are going to have a conversation, and I'm going to, and, and we are going to show you how the conversation looks. Where's the hat? I'm not there yet. She whips. Whose team is she on? Oh, wait, she's wearing my shirt. <laughs> Speaking of which, we've got a bunch of shirts up here. They're all 15 bucks. Uh, the new one here is Jesus is my temple recommend. And instead of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it says repent of your righteous deeds. Or righteous, yeah, righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6. And uh, you guys, since you've all seen the Impossible Gospel before or heard it, then uh, you should know what I'm getting at with that. So... We expect this to be a conversation starter, one way or the other. So, yes. So anyway, we're the way this is going to work is we're gonna we're gonna be talking through the impossible gospel. It's gonna go a lot quicker than it normally does on the street, simply because we've got a number of points that we want to cover. So I don't want you to feel like because you see us rush through it that you need to. This is easily a two and a half, three hour conversation. If you let, seriously, 
And, and it's because of a lot of the circular kind of argumentation that we talked about earlier. So, uh, so because we're going to end it at a certain time, I'm going to open it up for questions so that you can, you can ask, you know, why did you say this, or why didn't you go in this direction, or how does this work, or I would have done this, what do you think about that, you know, so we're going to open it up for Q&A, and there's a, a few things that I want to mention uh, that way. So, I guess we are ready to start here. <laughs> now we're ready to start. <laughs> <laughs> I am Manti Man. <laughs> so the way we usually start the conversation is we've got a little track here called the Pro Great Price. And it, it's not anti-Mormon. It doesn't say anything about Mormonism. It's just a modern day parable that explains how to have forgiveness of sin. And it's worded in such a way that a Mormon will understand it. Instead of saying God, it's Heavenly Father, it's of Heaven, it's Celestial Kingdom. So they can read through this and understand the message. It's the gospel in their language. Okay? So I usually start off by someone walking around or whatever. And would you like something to read for the pageant? Mm, what is it? Well, it's just a modern day parable that talks about how to have forgiveness of sins. Uh, well, um, I don't know. Is, is it anti-Mormon? It doesn't say anything about Mormonism. In fact, if you can find anything derogatory about Mormonism, I'll take you and your husband to lunch. If there isn't anything in there that, that you would find offensive, hopefully. Uh, it's just the gospel message in, uh, in worded in a way that hopefully you can understand. Okay. Can you move closer for the mics? I'm so sorry. Just scoot over. You're good. Thanks, good. Thanks. Okay. Well, sure. Uh, yeah. So it's about forgiveness? It is definitely about forgiveness of sin. Would you say that you're forgiven? Well, yes, of course. I mean, that's part of what comes with being a member of our church, because when you become baptized, you um, fall underneath the, the direction and leadership of the church, and you receive blessings from them, you, you um, make oaths and covenants, and you, you operate underneath the priesthood. And so that is, yeah, that's, so that's how we have forgiveness. And so, yes, I mean, so I don't know that I really well, you're, you're not a common Mormon. Most Mormons that I speak to would say that, that they're not forgiven or that they are forgiven for the sins for which they've repented. But for me to actually talk to a Mormon who knows that they're forgiven, that, that's kind of different for me. And a lot of the things that you mentioned, I'm not sure I, I find the connection between these things that you've got to do and how you personally are forgiven. Well, I don't know. I mean, you said, I don't know. You, you, have you talked to a lot... I mean, you look like you've been out. You've been out here before. I think I've seen you. I think <laughs> that hat. I mean, I, I, I recognize you for that hat because My I've wife seen loves you. His hat. <laughs> Everything that we believe 
gave all these teachings, they're in the Book of Mormon. Well, so, actually, you know, I've, I've got one here. And uh, there is a there's a verse I'd like to I'd like to get your opinion on. Would you, would you mind that? Okay. All right. This is uh, this is Moroni chapter ten thirty two and and I can read it now because I have my bifocals on. Uh, but it says yeah I'm getting there. It says yay come to <laughs> that's what the verse says. It says, Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. That is great. Tell, tell me what, what, that, what that means. Yes, this is a great passage, and it's in a great chapter, and I, I urge you to pray about all of this. So, come unto Christ. So, that, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, that's what we do in the church. We come under Christ, we, we, do, we do these things, and then the best part is the ending of this verse because it says that when we do all of these things, there is no way you can deny the power of God. I mean, the priesthood power is incredible. I've seen miracles in my life. I've seen miracles in my family through their patriarchal blessings. I mean, you just cannot deny the power of God. When you come to Christ, you You've received the things that he has to offer for you, and so um, that's a great verse. Yeah. I, did, I didn't quite catch your interpretation of the verse. I didn't read anything about patriarchal blessings. My, my, I guess what I want to find out is, did, did you catch the if-then statement? Uh, let me look at that again. So, yeah. Yeah, well, obviously, we have to live what we believe. We have to obey the commandments, we have to sustain our leaders, we have to do the things that are required of us. I mean, that's just common sense. Okay, so so the if would be the things that you've got to do. Correct. Okay, and what is the then part of the if then statement? Well, then, then is his grace. See, that's, that's the whole point. See, as we're going through our daily lives and striving to, to please God and as we're doing that, the grace is there to help us. He provides all those things for us. He, he, he shows us what to do. He, he gives us what we need to accomplish those things. He's, he, he gives us the grace that we need. It's, it's wonderful. You, you, should, you should be baptized. When does he give you the grace? He gives us the grace every day. Every day that we are following and obeying his commandments, that we receive the grace of Christ. Okay, then I'm not really understanding the if-then statement there. If you did, it says four things. If you deny yourself of all godliness, love God with all your might, all your mind, and all your strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. So, when does this grace kick in? It's there for us. It, we just have to avail ourselves to it. And I think, I think you're taking that a little bit too literally because... Um, that's not really the way it is. It's just, it's not meant to be that. It's, it's, you, it sounds like you're trying to say that I need to be perfect, and I don't like where you're going. So. Well, I, I'm not trying to say you need to be perfect. I'm looking at this, and I'm, I have to ask myself a question. If you did this, if you denied yourself of all ungodliness, what would your life look like? What would you be? Uh, I'd be really a great LDS woman. Okay. Like I am. Yeah. <laughs> right. But if you had no more... You should ask my husband. Well, I'm sure your husband would, would agree with you. <laughs> right. uh, so if you did this, if you denied yourself of all ungodliness, you have no more ungodliness in your life to deny, what would you be? Yeah, I, I, still, I still don't agree. I, I still don't think it's, it's that way. It's just, you're just trying to make it sound like we have to be perfect. Right. Maybe we need to look at this from a different perspective. Let me let me go to a different verse here. This is, is this, a Bible verse. Uh, no, actually, it's the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is Second Nephi, chapter twenty-five. to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God 
For we know that it is by grace that we are saved. What's that word there? After. After all we can do. So you're saved by grace when? It's after we do all that we can do. Exactly. Right. So are you doing all you can do? That is the goal. We are to be faithful in our scripture reading. We are to be faithful in our callings. We are to be um, training our children to um, be faithful members of the church. And so while we're doing all of those things, um, that is when all of that kicks in. Because Heavenly Father loves us and he has a plan for us. And it's the plan of happiness. And so as we're doing all of these things, it's, it's just right there for us. Okay, so to me it sounds like what you're saying is, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved while we do what we can do. <laughs> it's just not really that way. I mean, it's just, it's... I see what you're saying, but I, I still just don't like where you're going because you're just you're just being really. You know, I think I think there's a verse that you need to read. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take a picture of you.
So, are you out of your sins? No, but I'm, I'm going that direction. I mean, I'd like to talk to your husband and find out, you know, where, where you are with this. Well, he would never tell you because he's very Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a wonderful guy. Yes. Right. Well, right, the point is, the point is, you keep saying this is a process. Mm -hmm. And you've got to work this process. That, that brings up another verse in my mind, actually. This is in uh, 1 Nephi. Well, I, I believe this stuff firmly, and I just, I don't understand why people don't believe it, and why, you know, I mean, just, just look around. I mean, if, if you want to see examples of what this looks like, I mean, here you are at the pageant, you've got Faithful Mormons who are giving up so much of their time and energy. I mean, all of these young people rehearse for hours and hours to do this thing. And, you know, the, all the security people are volunteer and they are friendly and nice and none of them are paid. They are all volunteer. They sacrifice all this time. And I know for sure, because I live here, that Chip Thompson pays you guys. <laughs> I mean, if that is just not the most horrible, and you are coming here, I mean, what, what kind of comparison do you have to us? I mean, even our bishops and our state presidents, they are all unpaid volunteers, and they, they devote themselves so much, and you guys come out here and you just, you know, you're just in it for the money. That's actually, just all it is. Actually, that's Chip. I mean, he's... Actually, I found out, I found out something about Chip. Chip is really an undercover Mormon, and the Mormon church pays him to pay, to pay us to come out here to strengthen your testimony. <laughs> So, so 
God's going to give you a command. Let me ask you this question. According to this verse, and your interpretation of it, right. is God going to give you a commandment that you can't keep? No. I mean, that would be dumb of him to do that. And he gives us a commandment because, yeah, he knows we can do it. Okay, so, so you can do it. All of these commandments that you have, and you've got to keep these commandments to be forgiven, is that correct? Yes, right. Okay, so you've got to, you've got to keep these commandments. Uh, why don't you, actually, you tell me a little bit about that, these commandments that you have to keep. Well, we have to um, pay full tithe. We have to sustain our leaders. We have to have family home evening. We have to, um, you know, do household things, you know, take care of our children. We have, you know, the husbands need to go to the priesthood meetings, and the, the women need to be active in the Relief Society, and we need to... Um, you know, we do our scripture studies, we need to be having, make sure our children go to seminary, we need to, um, it's just, you know, we need to go to sacrament meeting, we need to, um, you know, help maybe the young women's, or, or whatever. I mean, those are the things that God has for us to do. Okay, what if you don't do these things? Are you forgiven? Well, it's, it's, we're kind of going that direction, see, because all of the commandments are, um, there for us to, to, to do and to accomplish. So that's why he gives it to him. But of course, I mean, it's right. not just an overnight thing. So you've got to keep the commandments to be forgiven. Yes. Right. How many of the commandments do you have to keep? All, all of them. How often do you have to keep them? All the time. So you've got to keep all the commandments all the time or you're not forgiven. I like it better when I say it. <laughs> but, uh, but that is the truth. Unless you keep all of the commandments all the time, and you can do this, unless you do this, you don't have the grace that's sufficient, you're not doing all you can do, so you're not saved by grace, and you're still in your sins. Yeah, but, okay, maybe this is, this is probably the thing that's going to really help me understand where we're going, because you obviously don't know that much about the church. But if we are trying, and if we are moving in the right direction, as long as God knows that I'm trying, then it's going to be okay, because I do my best, and he makes up the rest. It's just really simple. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're trying to obey the commandments. Yes. If you fail, what does that mean? It means that I need to repent. I need to um, dust myself off and get up. Better the next day. Okay, so if you try though, that means you fail. Well, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm improving. Are you trying to fail? Or no, I'm trying not to... trying to fail. Of course not. Okay, so you're trying to keep the commandments. <laughs> yes, and I'm, I'm doing better and better every day. Okay, and these commandments that God has given you, you can keep. Yes. So when you fail, whose who's fault is that? Well, it's fine, but, but sometimes, I mean, we're, we're weak, just in our weaknesses. Sometimes they're not really, um, like, sins. They're just mistakes, you know? They're just, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't know, are you educated at all? <laughs> Did you go to college or anything? Yes. Okay, we well, you know, you have the scantrons, and sometimes you're going through, and sometimes you just accidentally fill in the wrong bubble. Okay. Sometimes, just because of our weakness as humans, those are things that, that, you know, just accidentally happen. And so as long as we're aware of that and we're trying to just repent of those things, then Heavenly Father will understand that because he knows that we're weak. So, so did Jesus, Jesus die for our sin or did he die for our mistakes? I mean, it seems to be kind of severe for him to just die for my mistakes. No, he died for our sins. But, but see, not everything is as bad as what you're wanting to make it. It's, it's, not everything is, you know, like murder or adultery or something. But it's still sin that he died for, which is kind of serious. Yeah, it's sin, but not everything is a sin. And those things, he knows that as we're, as we're trying, as we're, I mean, trying. It's just, it's the best that we can do at that point. So. Well, have you ever kept a commandment? Yes, of course. All right, so wouldn't you say that was your best? Yes. So when you do your best, you keep the commandments. Correct. But when
when you try, you fail. Well, when I try, sometimes I fail. And sometimes I fall short. So... But the point is, I'm trying. What is the problem? You just, you have a problem with that word. I mean, don't you try to improve your life and to improve your, your relationship with your really cute wife over there? <laughs> or, I mean, aren't, don't you, don't you work on those things? Don't you try to, to get things going in the better, the better direction if you fail? I mean, of course, you're not just going to grovel in the dirt or whatever. You're going to try. You're going to pick yourself up and get after it. You familiar with Spencer W. Kimball? Of course. Familiar with his book, Miracle of Forgiveness? Mm, yeah, that's a hard book. <laughs> well, so. I just happen to have that book with me here. I'm not and, surprised. Yeah, and, uh, and he actually had something to say about trying. And uh, the, the heading here, it, it says what? Trying is... Not sufficient. Trying is not sufficient. Now I'm going to read this part. It's kind of long, but just... Bear with me here. It says, trying is not sufficient. Wait, wait, wait. That's the real That's thing? The real what page thing. is that? It's on page 164. Oh, okay. All right. Just making sure, you know. Well, you never know. With you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so trying is not sufficient, nor is repentance complete when one merely tries to abandon <laughs> sin. To try with a weakness of attitude and effort is to assure failure in the face of Satan's strong counteracting efforts. What is needed is resolute action. A story will perhaps illustrate this. An army officer called a soldier to him and ordered him to take a message to another officer. The soldier saluted and said, I'll try, sir, I'll try. To this, the officer responded, I don't want you to try. I want you to deliver this message. The soldier, somewhat embarrassed, now replied, I'll do the best I can, sir. At this, the officer, now disgusted, rejoined with some vigor. I don't want you to try, and I don't want you to do the best you can. I want you to deliver the message. Now the young soldier, straightening to his full height, approached the matter magnificently as he thought when he saluted again and said, I'll do it or die, sir. To this the now irate officer responded, I don't want you to die, and I don't want you to merely do the best you can, and I don't want you to try. Now the request is a reasonable one, the message is important, the distance is not far, you are able-bodied, you can do what I have ordered, now get out of here and accomplish your mission. It's normal for children to try. They fall and get up numerous times before they can be, be certain of their footing. But adults who have gone through these learning periods must determine what they will do, then proceed to do it. To try is... Go ahead, you can read it. To try is weak. To do the best I can is not strong. We must always do better than we can. So... If you were to have this conversation with Spencer W. Kimball, and you told him you were trying, what do you think he would say to you? He would say that that's why we have repentance. And that's the whole reason why that book was written. It was to help people in the church who may be falling into you know, one of the more serious sins to, um, to make sure that they knew that there was a way to repent, a way to, to um, work through that process. So, um, I see what you're getting at, but um, that is one of the huge blessings of <coughs> repentance. Can I, can I say something? Because uh, I, think, I think you're like a really nice lady. I think what you've been saying is really nice. I think really what you need to know is that, that, that Jesus really loves you and, and that you need to really know Jesus better. I really think that's the, the, the crux of the whole matter here. I do it's okay. know. Okay. Yeah, but, but she just she just doesn't understand who Jesus is. If she's really nice. She would, right. you know, she's trying really right. hard. Yeah, but just she, she knew who Jesus this was. Is one. This is my one. There's plenty of other ones. You can go you can go get a conversation with plenty of other ones. I got my own one. So, go get your own one. <laughs> Heart's in the right place, and sometimes his mouth isn't, so. <laughs> so anyway, Spencer W. Kim, he would tell you. He would tell me that um, I need to work really, really hard, and then when I fail, I need to repent. That's, that's about as simple as it gets. That's why we have that teaching. Okay, so when, when you try, you fail. Correct. All right. So you want to do. Yes, I the goal is to keep the commandments. Okay. You play volleyball? Sometimes, yeah. All right. 
when, whenever somebody dives for the ball, the ball's hit over the net, they dive for the ball, and they get underneath it and they hit it, and they don't quite get it over the net, what's everybody say? Oh, nice. Nice try. Nice try. You know what that means? That the ball hit the ground. You failed. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't get the ball over the net. But if somebody gets a really good set, and somebody like me comes up and just, <laughs> boom, and kills the ball, nice spike, what do you say? Nice try. No, you say. Good job. Good job. That's yeah, right. Yeah, nice fight. That's right. Good job. So, good job is success. You did it. Right. Nice try is. Means you need to repent. Right. <laughs> I feel like a broken record. I mean, I keep saying that. You just need to repent. That is one of the best things about our church that we have to offer because, you know, it's not an easy thing. We just do what the prophet says and repent. And that's one of his biggest. Emphases of that book. Okay, you keep saying repent. What, what do you mean by repent? Well, um, there's a process. That there's steps. Okay. You have to um, you have to admit that you fall short. Mm -hmm. You need to um, uh, confess the sin. You need to abandon the sin. You need to make restitution mm -hmm. whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And then you need to um, obey the Lord. You need to keep the commandments and. Then you have successfully repented. So. All right, so you've successfully repented when you do those things. Yes. All right, so, so what does <coughs> what does successful repentance look like then? Uh, well, you you work through the steps. I mean, it's just a process. It's it's not something he expects, you know, just like that. And I don't understand what's so hard to understand about those five steps. It's really really simple. Admit it. You quit it. You well, first you got to. You admit it, you confess it, then you quit it, and you, you know, like I said, you make restitution and you, you keep going, you keep the commandments. Okay, there's a, a section of Adoption Covenant that explains what repentance looks like. Okay. This is DNC 58, uh, 42 and 43. It says, Behold, he who has repented of his sin, the same is forgiven. And I, the Lord, remember them no more. And then, verse 43, he says, by this ye may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess and forsake. So that's how we know. If someone is truly repentant, they've got to forsake the sin. Right. They have to uh, try to get rid of it. They have to... Try it? Well, they need to obey the commandments. And they, right. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you see, you know these verses. You, you, you know, you just think you're really cool or something out there about and you, um, but you don't have the right understanding of the verses because you don't have Latter-day Revelation. You don't have the prophet. I mean, I don't even know if you know where a prophet is. You probably Thomas don't. Thomas Never heard. Okay, so he's our prophet, and so he and the other prophets help us um, understand these verses in, in a way that makes it helpful and makes it simple and makes it um, doable for us as Latter-day Saints. So, so you're just to... you're just you're just taking them out of context. You're just misinterpreting them. I, I don't know who teaches you this, but you just you don't you're not understanding them properly. All right. So so this you're claiming that I've taken the NC to be out of context. Yes, it's got to be because it's you're making it bigger, you're making it harder than it is. How would you like to know what Spencer Kimball said about that? Well, he's gone. I mean, his word is still authoritative. Well, yeah, but I mean, he's, he's been dead a while, so I can't just, you know, call him on the phone. He's been, you know. Right. But I mean, that that, that would mean something to you, though, to have a living prophet at he's the time. Dead. At the time, at the time, to have a living prophet explain something to you. Sure, yeah, that's 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 nice. Yeah. <laughs> I just happen to have this little booklet here, Repentance Springs Forgiveness. It's an unnumbered track, but if you open it up to the very middle section, he actually explains <coughs> just what you said about repentance. Five steps, sorrow for sin, abandonment of sin, confession of sin, restitution for sin, and doing the will of God. See, I am doing all I can do. I got it right. Okay, well, we'll see about that. Uh, you got the abandonment of sin, that's the one that I really have a concern about. Okay. Right, because you probably don't care about living in well, no, you can talk to my wife about that, and I'm sure she would correct you. So, uh, abandonment of sin. It says, it is best when one stops sinning because he becomes aware of the seriousness of his sin. 
He then should want to comply with all the laws of God. The thief may abandon his evil in prison, but true repentance would have him forsake it before his arrest and return what he had stolen voluntarily. The sex offender who voluntarily stops his sin is headed toward forgiveness. Alma said, Blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. And the Lord said, and this is DNC 5843, okay. By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will forsake them. Now he's going to explain what he means by that. The forsaking of sin must be a permanent, a permanent one. True repentance does not permit making the same mistake again. Okay, yeah, it kind of sounds like this book, doesn't it? Yeah, kind of sounds like this book. So when, when I read DNC 58, and then I read Spencer W. Kimball's interpretation of that particular verse, I get the impression that the way that I can know that someone is truly forgiven is if they have, one of five steps, abandoned their sin. So, if you have abandoned your sin, how would that look like in your life? Well, you wouldn't do it anymore. And of course, God doesn't want us to just give him lip service and say, oh yeah, um, I really don't want to you know, yell at my kids anymore, so I won't do it. And then two minutes later, go off again. I mean, right. That is just not really having sorrow for your sin and really doing the process of repentance because he just went back and did it again. So of course he wants us to abandon our sin. I mean, doesn't your church teach that? Uh, yeah, with a different emphasis. My, my question is, if you do it again, what does that imply? That you're talking, that you're, you're... Which is weak. Yeah, which needs improvement. Which is failure. Right, so then I just, here it is. I repent again. I just say, okay, Lord, you know, I messed up. I need your help. Please help me to, to do this, and I will repent again. I mean, that is a huge blessing, knowing that I can repent again. So, um, this, uh, so there. This, <laughs> this last part there, the true repentance does not permit making the same mistake again. Right. That's when you really have gotten the full effect of the atonement when you have really um, carried it through to the end and you've stuck it out and you've been diligent and you have fully repented and then yeah, that would be that would be true repentance. Okay, so keeping this in mind, mm -hmm. is there such a phrase as repent again? What do you mean by that? Well, uh, I've got an uncle who says that quitting smoking is easy. He's done it a hundred times. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not okay. So that's not true repentance. Right, because if you just keep going back to the same sin, then you're not repentant. Exactly. So, there, right. so then would you agree with me that there's no such phrase as repent again? You either are repeating the sin, or you repent of the sin, which means you will forsake it. You will never do it again. Okay. So I have a and he has um, had some trouble with alcoholism, and he has gone to AA, and he has, it's, it's been a process. He's been working through it, and he has completed that process, and he doesn't drink anymore, and he doesn't get near the stuff. So that is true repentance right there, because it's gone. He doesn't commit that sin anymore. Mm -hmm. So... So once, so so he is repentant of alcoholism. Correct. Which means. Which shows that it can be done. You see. Exactly. Isn't that great? First Nephi by three seven. Right. You got you, it. You can do it. Don't you be baptized now? There's a temple right there. <laughs> I couldn't come right here to be baptized. Yeah, they wouldn't let you. Know. Exactly. Especially that hat. Right. <laughs> Maybe if it was white. So it can be done. Yes. How are you doing? Well, there are some sins that I am definitely, I complete the process on, like, you know, things to do in college or high school or whatever, that, you know, as you grow up and you have kids and, you know, your kids tend to copy things you do, so you don't like that when they see that in your kids, and so then you don't do that anymore because it's really bad when you see it in your kids. So, yeah, there are some sins that I've definitely been able to check off the list. 
So, okay, so, so is that you, great? So, hey, do you have any? Sure, absolutely. I do. Okay. Really do. I got some that I like too much, though, too. I keep going back to them. Like coming out to Manti to attack our room. Well, I don't, right? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a sin. Um, I, I keep coming out here uh, because we love the Mormon people. I, I believe that I have something that you're still looking for. From what we have read and from what we agree with says, you have to completely forsake your sin before you are forgiven. Yet earlier in our conversation, you said that you were forgiven. But then after we go through this, we find out that you, there's still some sins that you're working, and I don't care to go there and find out what all these secret sins are. But you know, and God knows, and God knows your heart. I've had a lot of Mormons tell me, as long as I'm headed in the right direction, I'm okay. My heart is, you know, God sees my heart. Well, unfortunately, that's true. God does see our heart. And, and if this is true, if DNC 58 is true, and true repentance looks like forsaking sin, and you're not going to be forgiven until you forsake that sin, then you're not forgiven. So... Yeah, but you guys are the exact opposite. You are the polar opposite of our church because all you guys think is that all you need to do is just say, oh, I believe in Jesus, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and you just can do it again. You just, it's easy grace, it's just wrong, and you guys think that, that you can just go on out and sin again and you don't even care about, you know, who you might mess up in the way or who you might... You just you just think it's too easy. That that's that's the problem with you evangelicals. You just you just don't get it in terms of living a clean life and getting things you know the way they need to be because you just think that Jesus is like this free ticket to heaven or whatever, and that is just not right. And that's not what he meant. And that's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Book of Mormon says. And it's just wrong. Why do you say that? Why do you say wrong? Because it's not that easy. It can't be that easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus. Right, but so then it's not going to be easy for us either because he's our savior, he's our example. Of course he wants us to strive to be like him. I mean, you said you had kids. Don't you want your kids to be just like you or maybe better than you in your case, I guess, but I don't know. I would agree just, with you. Just you want your kids to strive to improve and to... Not keep sinning all the time. What is so wrong with not wanting to sin all the time? I didn't say there was anything wrong with not wanting to sin. <coughs> In fact, uh, Spencer Kimball mentioned something about that. And that is, again, it's, it's difficult for me to grasp. Because of what he says here. It says this passage, this is on uh, page 354 and 355. This passage indicates an attitude which is basic to the sanctification we should all be seeking, and thus to the repentance which merits forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's my repentance which merits forgiveness. Right. It is that the former transgressor, why do you think it's called a former? Because you don't do it anymore. Okay, the former transgressor must have reached a point of no return, mm -hmm. in wherein there is not merely a renunciation, but also a deep abhorrence of the sin, where the sin becomes most distasteful to him, and where the desire or urge to sin is cleared out of his life. If this is true, and I can't be forgiven until the desire or urge to sin is cleared out of my life, right, like your uncle. That's what I'm saying. Right. Okay. My uncle. My uncle continues to smoke. Right. Mine quit. Your yours quit. Yeah. Okay, That's right, quick. because of the priesthood power, which so, your uncle doesn't have. So your father was, a, or your uncle was an alcoholic priest? <laughs> no, because of the priesthood helping him and praying for him and teaching him and blessing him. Right, so and if your else, uncle had that, he could quit smoking. So somebody else's priesthood helped your uncle? Of course, because we have the proper authority, and that's what you don't have. Could your uncle do it himself? Well, maybe, but it's certainly a lot easier if you're connected with the right spiritual source to, to help you with your problems. According to 1 
three five three seven, can your uncle do it? Evidently, you're saying yes because he did. Yes, but he definitely had help and he, he did it. He had to do it. He, he had to do it himself. He had to do it. He had to resist those temptations. He had to do it. But your uncle needs that power. Okay. And so, but you know what? Well, my uncle can do it according to First Nephi three seven because your uncle did it. Yes, he should be his example. So it can Maybe they be done. Meet. Maybe they should. Maybe they should. Okay. But, but it can be done. Right. So to forsake sin means that you can be forgiven of that sin, and that's what that's what repentance looks like. It mean, it looks like forsaking sin. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you are your uncle, and that you had a problem with alcoholism, and that you have successfully abandoned that sin. Okay. That's one. Okay, yeah. What about all your other sins? Like, uh, hey, 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 hey. Well, this, this is all biblical stuff here. I mean, I'm not calling you, I'm not saying anything of you that isn't true of myself. Okay. Pride. Uh, covetousness. Jealousy. What about those things? To never have the desire to covet something again. Right. Until you reach the point of no return on that, never doing it again, you are unforgiven. For that area, right? But it takes one. But I'm getting I'm getting there, and then Heavenly Father also has provided another huge blessing for us that I know you know nothing about, which is I can complete my repentance. Those, those things that I've struggled through that I haven't been able to finish, I can complete that after death. He has provided that for us, and that is another reason why you should join our church, because I'm sure you can't do that by yourself in this life either, and he doesn't expect us to. He knows that we're perfect, and that we're not perfect, but that we can try to be, and that we're and so we have the next life to help us with those areas we really have a hard time with. Well, you, you keep mentioning this, I should join your church mm -hmm. because this system works. Mm -hmm. The problem is I can't find anyone who works the system. Do you know anyone who has successfully abandoned their sin? Thomas S. Watson, has he successfully abandoned his sin? Mm, probably not everything. I mean, he's probably pretty close, closer than any of us. Okay, regardless of how close he is, right. he's still unforgiven. Yeah, but we have the next life. We have that. We, we, we existed before we came here. We come down to this earth to receive a body, to, um, to, to work our way back, to, to live with our Heavenly Father again. And, and after we die, you know, we have some more time in order to perfect ourselves and to repent of those things that we still need to repent of. And then we hopefully, you know, if we're doing real good, we will live with Heavenly Father again. And so, that's the plan of happiness. So Isn't that great? Well, uh, except that I don't find that in the Book of Mormon. In fact, I find the opposite. And, and you do believe the Book of Mormon, right? Of course. I mean, the, the sixth paragraph of the introduction says that it's the most correct book on earth. Right. It is the most correct book. I'm glad you think that too. It's, I'm just quoting. Oh. <laughs> and it's the keystone of your religion, and that you're going to get near to God by abiding by its precepts and by any other book. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of authoritative, right? Great. Right. What so, are you showing? This is Alma chapter 34. We start with verse 32. And this actually addresses the idea that you have of repenting in the afterlife. It says, For behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. And now, as I have said unto you before, as you have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can no labor be performed. Verse 34. Ye cannot say, when you are brought to that awful crisis, that I will repent, that I will return to my God. Nay, ye cannot say that. For that same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the, sign, at the time that you go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. For behold, if you have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even unto death, 
Behold, you have become subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. Therefore the spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you, and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you. And this is the temporary, this is the final state of the wicked. Final state of the wicked. Of who? Of the wicked. The wicked. That is what you're missing. That is for the wicked. That is not for you and I. That is for, you know, people who, you know, pay others to come tear down their people's religions, people like that. You know, people who, who murder people, you know, Hitler. That is the final state of the wicked. I kind of get the sense that you really don't like the fact that I'm here. Yeah. Well, you know, the Mormon missionaries, they come to my house. And since I didn't know where you lived, I figured I'd meet you. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So, but that verse, those, those verses are for it's the final state of the wicked. And, right. and it says right here. And who are the wicked? Those, hang on, just, those are, uh, if we do not improve our time while in this life. Uh-huh. That is what I've been trying to say to you all along. As long as we are improving our time, as long as we are trying, as long as we are doing the best we can, as long as we are trying, striving to follow all the commandments, we have to improve our time. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and it also says that this life is the time to prepare to be God. Right. If you are in your sins, which you have admitted that you are, are you prepared to be God? Well, not today, but I'm working in that direction. Not today. Behold this life. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, this, this is a busy street sometimes. The EMS come flying through here. We could be hit by a car or a truck, you know, any minute. And until you have completed your repentance, you are procrastinating. And the wicked, according to the context here, are those who are procrastinating their repentance. I'm not purposely doing that. I'm just, I'm just weak. We're all weak. I'm not purposely putting things off. I'm just striving. You're striving, which means you're not doing. Right. Not not perfectly. And what kind of repentance does God require? Is incomplete or complete repentance? He wants it to be complete. He wants us to keep and, and when does it need to be completed? Well, that passage says this life. But we have other Latter-day Revelation as well that is just um, a lot more helpful and uplifting and um, can help us understand those things better. And, you know, I just feel so sorry for you being out here and wasting your time with people who already follow Christ, and I bear you my testimony that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, that Thomas S. Monson is his prophet today, that the church, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is the only true church on the face of the earth. The Book of Mormon is the word of God. And I just think you need to pray about it, and you need to go do something better with your time. Well, I, first, I, I can't think of anything better to do my, with my time. And I don't think that being out here is a waste of time, because I don't think you are a waste of time. Well, I'm here to show you what Mormonism requires of you. And you spent uh, specifically mentioned that I should join your church. If I should join your church and this system works, then I should be able to work the system. Yet you have admitted that you don't know anyone who has, and I would say, who can do it. It's a task that is set before you that no one has ever done. So what is the difference between you and me? Why should I join your church and be accountable to this? Because I know the church is true. It's been revealed in these latter days, and it's been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. And you just need to pray about it. You need to meet with some missionaries in your home, and they can help you understand it. And um, I just I just think that's what you need to know. I need to go find my family and, and uh, hope you have a nice day. Well, I hope you have a nice day, too. Thank you for our conversation. Uh, I, I, hope, uh, I hope I've given you some things to think you, about. You've given me some things to think about. And my, uh, my contact information is on the back of the track. And uh, if you've got any questions, I, I'd love to try to answer them. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you.
I've got some doing major hat head, hat head on YouTube. Well, that's kind of how a lot of the conversations go. Um, Becky and I had a, a loose script. We didn't totally keep to it. Um, basically, a, a lot of what I do is dependent upon what the Mormon says and how they do it. And, and there were a number of times when I could have chased a rabbit. I could have gone in a different direction, but I chose not to do that. And, and if you notice, I did a lot of listening. Uh, sometimes the Mormon will go off in different directions and talk about things that have absolutely nothing to do with what you're trying to get at. Just patiently wait for them to be finished and then just get them right back on track. And that's why I did a lot of, of what I do. Do I have any, any questions here? I saw a hand. This is like an auction. You move, I'm going to call it. <laughs> One thing I did want to mention about 1 Nephi 3.7, that is the key right there. That is the linchpin to the impossible gospel. Because you can use Moroni 10.32, Alma 11.37, or 2 Nephi 25.23. You can use any of those. But unless you nail it down with 1 Nephi 3.7, they're going to continue to go in the direction of I can try or I can do the best I can or all this. And they're just going all over the map. But when you nail it down and keep holding them accountable to, you can do this, they don't have an out. They've got no place to go. And that will help stop the, uh, the, the circle, basically. So, no question. You're on your t-shirt, it says, uh, repent of your righteousness. And there's a verse from Isaiah. But what is the verse there and what does the verse say? Good question. Question was on my T-shirt. I've got "Repent of your righteousness," Isaiah 64, 6. Uh, that verse says that all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And the reason why we did this shirt here is because this temple recommend is a sign of what? It's their worthiness. In fact, who was it? Uh, somebody last night. I think somebody on my team. Um, they got to talking to a Mormon about this, started getting into the impossible gospel. This guy whips out his wallet to show him his temple recommend. That's how worthy I am. Well, Isaiah 64, 6, your, your, your righteous deeds are as filthy rats. How are you going to please God with your filthy rats? So that's a verse that's really good to ask them because they're going to talk about all the things that they do and all the things that we're not doing. But focusing, again, on everything that they do so that they can earn this, uh, merit the repentance, or re how did that put it? <laughs> the repentance that merits forgiveness. So they're trying to merit their own forgiveness through their works. So. Any questions? It is 11.45, so we ended a little bit early. Um, let me go ahead and pray. I guess we'll all go. Or no, Chip's probably got some announcements. But I'll, I'll still pray. Lord God, thank you for, uh, thanks for a good crowd this morning. Thanks for everybody that's here, all of the people who are new. It's such an encouragement to us who've been coming here for a while to see as many people as there are here who are going to be out there on the streets and preaching your word. Lord, we just ask that you would give us uh, the right opportunities, good opportunities with the right Mormons, and please uh, keep the weather away. Lord, we'd like to see some sunny skies and, uh, and lots of good opportunities to witness. Please work in our hearts. Uh, uh, we want to be tools usable for your honorable service. And Lord, uh, and help us to be clean so that we can be used as you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.